treasure
shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. We soon shall hear your angel's voice, the trumpet. All of the time, um, not least now in recent days, I'm sure like me, you've been gutted as you've heard of prominent Christian leaders who've fallen from grace as their sins have been exposed. Many of us are also leaders in our churches at different levels and we're aware of our own frailties and temptations and we wonder, how can I be a faithful leader? How can I stay being a faithful leader? Well, I'm grateful that Rico Tice is here, and we're going to be discussing some of those issues this morning. If you were here last night, you would have been very blessed by Rico's ministry from Luke 1, and we're very grateful, Rico, that you're here with us, and we'd just like to pray for you and ourselves as we start. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you've taught us this week through Rico. Pray that you would continue to bless his ministry at All Souls, through Christianity Explored, through his writing, his teaching, his traveling. Heavenly Father, we pray for his family, we pray for Lucy and their children. Pray most especially for his children that they would grow up to know you and love you and follow you wholeheartedly. Pray for Rico that you would keep him close to yourself, that you would guard his devotional times pray that you would continue to use him for the glory of your kingdom. And for ourselves, Heavenly Father, as we sit under your word this morning, teach us what it means to be faithful and to keep on pursuing faithful, faithfulness daily in the power of your spirit and for the glory of your name, we pray. Amen. 
If you've got your hand out, we're going to read Joshua 7 together. It's a long passage, so take a deep breath and let's go. Joshua 7. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Kami, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, the, to the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or 3,000 men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few men live there. So about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel have sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen, they have lied, they have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they've been, been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies till you remove them. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe that the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan that the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Whoever is caught with the devoted thing shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes and Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward and the Zerahites were chosen. He made the clans of the Zerahites come forward by families and Zimri was chosen. Joshua made his family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in the tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. 
Over Achan, they heaped up a a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we, um, we, we come with great humility. We come as sinful men and women, but we... We deep down long for the glory of Jesus because you have caused us to come to you. You've done this act of recreation and deep in our hearts we do want your son honoured most of all. We're amazed but that is the truth and you know that. Lord please help us in this session to uh, see our own sin, to be uh, uh, deeply uh, concerned for the sin in the churches, uh, to protect the next generation to not be those that feed on the sheep. Please, Lord, for the honour of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, It is so discouraging when leaders fail. Um, When Jonathan Fletcher, who was at Emmanuel Wimbledon, when it was in the paper, I'd known him quite well as a younger man. Um, And uh, when when it was in the Telegraph, uh, just what he had done, and uh, what John Smythe had done, so I come from a Ewan background, I couldn't get out of bed that morning. I was so discouraged. I rang in to Hugh Palmer, my boss. I said, Hugh, do you mind if I not come in? And it's, it's so discouraging. And I think I always used to think that the Liberals were the wolves in sheep's clothing. But what we've seen recently with uh, Jonathan Fletcher, with Ravi Zacharias, is people who feed on the sheep. Feeding on the sheep. So uh, they use the sheep for themselves. And don't serve the sheep for the glory of God. And so this passage um, has always um, really made me sweat. It's searing. Now what's interesting about this passage, do you jot this down, brothers and sisters, is, now this is fascinating. Before the Haringey mission that Billy Graham took, 1954, he preached this passage to the leaders. So you've got the whole of Scripture that Billy Graham's going to go to, and he goes to Achan Sin. Isn't that amazing? before that huge mission that 2 million people went to and 40,000 were converted at. Isn't that extraordinary? And I want to begin by saying, and again, do jot this down, have you ever felt genuine fear? Because this passage is not to cause a butterfly, but an eagle in our stomachs as we come to it. And uh, we're going to look at it now under the heading of leadership. Its um, lessons will be evident But I am praying you can take them to your heart and back to your churches. And all I can say is, brothers and sisters, I am a bad man, but I'd be a lot worse were it not for this passage. I really would. This passage has seared me. And I'm in this little book, uh, Faithful Leaders, that came out of that morning in bed. Because I lay in bed that morning as I was so depressed, and I thought of people like Uncle John, John Stott. And I thought, now what was it about them that made them faithful as I'd seen them? Do you know, with Uncle John, I really mean this. The closer you got to him, the more godly he got. The closer you got, the more godly he was. And I remember when he'd fallen and hurt his hip, and um, it was between Christmas and New Year, and I let myself into his flat to pop up to see him. He was on his own. Everyone was away. We were the only two bachelors on staff at that stage. And uh, I got up to him, and and the hip break had been terrible in terms of loss of of freedom and, 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 you know, independence. And so he hadn't behaved particularly well. But as I walked in, he burst into tears. And he said, Rico, I've really behaved very sinfully and selfishly. And I'd like you now to be my chaplain and pray that I would be forgiven. So um, I, I, have, I, have, I have lost my temper and I just want you to pray for me. So I sat there and I said, Lord God, Uncle John's behaved very badly. And he was sitting there weeping about his own sin. Can you imagine as I came out from that session, I had to go and have a shower. I felt so terrible about my own. But amazing to have a leader of that stature confessing his sin, wanting forgiveness. You know, I did 1 John 1, 8 and 9 with him. (laughs) So humbling, really. But, uh, But at the heart of Uncle John's spirituality was his awareness of sin. If you read the two biographies of Timothy Dudley Smith, The second one, the final chapter, at the heart of it was his awareness of sin. So he understood, do jot this down, the golden chain of discipleship, which is sin, grace, joy, discipleship, evangelism, training. It's not discipleship, evangelism, training. If you look at the people who've fallen, there's been a problem in their sin, grace, joy. 
So the first thing I do is I grow downwards and I see my sin. I see my sin. I remind myself again of the, of the wonder of the gospel. I feel joy, and just jot this down, uh, if, if the joy of the Lord isn't my strength, I, I lose my strength. The joy of the Lord, I, every day, what does it mean to be rejoicing afresh in the gospel? Well, it's growing downwards, as jo- Simeon taught this to start. You grow downwards, you see your sin, and from there you s- remember God's grace, and you go out in thanksgiving, rather than resentment. Let's have a look at the passage now. Let's just jump straight into it. Can we pick it up? Joshua chapter 7. Here it is. Beautifully read for us. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And I'm hoping you're going to start sweating. Well, let's head in um, uh, 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 and hold on to your seats. Compared to Jericho, the city of Ai is a minor objective. It ought to have fallen uh, with very little resistance. I guess in rugby terms, it's an Italy rather than the All Blacks. I think that's what we're saying. And by the way, if you don't understand that illustration, get a life. It's a problem with your doctrine of creation, if you don't understand that. (laughs) But but, but the the point here is being made in verses 2 and 3, isn't it, as we look down. Now, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near the Beth Haven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go and spy out the land. Ai was strategic. Uh, Its conquest would would give Israel control of the main route into the land. Uh, Verse 2, the men went up and spied out the land, 13 of them. It's 13 miles away, AI, they return and they say, look, it's going to be no problem. It'll be a piece of cake. Uh, Not all the army will have to go up against AI. Send two or three thousand men to do, to take it and don't weary the whole army for only a few people live there. Well, you can imagine Joshua breathing a sigh of relief. Um, The spies return. He'll delegate this to a junior commander. Good experience for some of the younger players uh, as as they, as they, they go in. Um, let the younger ones get involved. I mean, Jericho was taken without a single casualty, so this will be fine. We don't even have to pray, and then we get verse 4. Verse 4. So about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gates as, uh, 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 as far as the stone quarries and struck them down. And this is the only defeat recorded in the book of Joshua. Um, It's the only time that the Israelites are slain in battle. And at this, the the hearts of the people melted. Do we see that? So so, so, uh, they chased the Israelites from the city gates, verse 5, and the stone quarries, end of the verse, at this, the hearts of the people melted. Now, uh, up until that time, the hearts of the inhabitants of the land have melted. So Rahab the prostitute, chapter 2, verse 9 says, when we heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea... And what you did to Zion and Og, whom you completely destroyed, our hearts melted. Chapter 5, verse 1, for your notes, when the Amorite kings heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan, their hearts melted. So it's not surprising, in the spring, the dissolving snow means that the Jordan is a, in, that, in those days um, was, was a major hurdle. It's a, it's a, it's a huge um, a torrent of water. But uh, it dries up and they walk across. The boot's now on the other foot. 3,000 go up, 7 verse 4, 36 are killed. Their hearts melt and uh, like water. Verse 6, when Joshua tore his clothes, fell face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening, the elders did the same and facing down into the mud, he blubbers and bawls out three devastating questions and they all head in the same direction. Can you see the three questions? Just look for yourself, please, in verses 7, 8, 9. So just for yourself, dig out the three questions, please. And by the way, there will be questions at the end as well, just to say. So three questions that are there. What are the three questions? They all head in the same direction. Verse 7, alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever uh, 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 send your people up into the land? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Okay, verse 8, Lord, what can I say now that Israel have been routed by their enemies? Verse 9, what then will you do for your great name? Do you see? They're all about snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, these questions. And, 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 And then there is a massive shock Uh, at the start of verse 10. I'm going to give a book to the person that can tell me what is the shock at the beginning of verse 10. There's an extraordinary shock that happens between verses 9 and 10. What's the shock in verse 10? Anyone got it? 
Anyone shout out the shock? Stand up. Well, stand up, yes, but what does stand up mean? You're quite right, it is stand up. What's he saying? What's God saying to Joshua and the elders? The Lord said, stand up, what are you doing on your face? Well, there's that, there's that, it could be that, but he's saying to them, will you stop praying? He's saying, you're down on the ground praying, I want you to stop praying. It's amazing, and instead, he said, judge the situation by the word of God. It's amazing in the Anglican church at the moment, brothers and sisters, there's loads of calls to prayer, but there are not calls to obedience to God's word. And if you're not going to obey God's word, there's no point praying. His ears will be stopped. Have a look at verse 10. You see, verse 10 and 11. Let's look down. Uh, Stand up. What are you doing on your face? Israel, let's judge the situation by the word of God. Israel has sinned. They violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen. They've lied. They've put them with their own possessions. That's why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and wrong because they've been made liable to destruction. And now the key phrase from the first half of the book of Joshua. Do jot it down. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. I will not be with you anymore is the great message, the great warning of Joshua. So just to say this is such an issue here. We mustn't have prayer meetings if we're not prepared to, 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 to obey the word of God because God, God's ears will be stopped. It's amazing. I see these liberals in the Church of England call us to prayer and yet they keep reinforcing disobedience to God's word. <laughs> Just desperate. Uh, Dr. Al Martin was a Baptist preacher in the deep south of America. He used to tell the story of an old man who each week would come to the church prayer meeting and zealously pray, oh Lord, the old spider of sin, the spider of sin has been weaving its web, weaving its web. Uh, uh, And each week he'd pray the same prayer. Um, uh, uh, Lord, the old spider of sin has been weaving its web, weaving its web. Break the web, Lord, break the web. Until the pastor, totally frustrated one week with this prayer coming again, shouted out, no Lord, kill the spider. (laughs) Kill the spider. And Joshua needs to stop theologizing, stop praying, and deal with the situation. There has been a clear instruction in chapter 6, verse 18. When it comes to any plunder from Jericho, keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you'll make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. You've got to obey the Bible. And when you pray, so what prayer is, is this, isn't it, at one level? God speaks to me in scripture and I speak back to him about what he's spoken to me about. But I don't go, oh, well, no, I don't like that bit, so we're not having that and we'll be disobeying that. In fact, we'll pray for the opposite. It's just amazing. Uh, There are moments, and I have this from a soldier who's seen active service, in the chaos and commotion of battle, when apparently everything stops, almost moments of solitude and calm, as you can hear bullets fizzing past. Uh, He said it's extraordinary. Those of you who might have been in a car crash will know that time freezes. It just stops. Everything goes in slow motion. Well, I wonder if you can imagine uh, Achan, uh, 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 and and he's in the siege of Jericho, and he enters a house, and uh, the house is cleared, but he lingers for a moment in the solitude of that front room, and verse 21 tells us what what happens. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They're hidden in the ground inside my tent. The silver is underneath. So he sees what in our terms would have been probably that bar of gold uh, is 360,000 quid. Um, So it's probably half a million pounds worth of plunder. And he goes in and of course he thinks to himself, no one will ever notice, no one will see. They, they, they won't be missed. What a waste. We're only going to burn them. God can't really have meant that. It's such good stuff. And in the isolation, do jot this down, he looked, he longed, he took, and he lied. And I wonder if you can imagine him creeping through the darkness to his tent because he goes back into Jericho having hidden the, the treasure and his heart pounding and sighing with relief, he gets in the tent and he shows his wife the gold and the silver, and they know that the future is secure. The college fees will be paid, the mortgage will be paid off. When they enter the land, they can get the land they want. 
And of course, what he had not done, and brothers and sisters, this is a huge part of why leaders fall. He had not examined his idols. We have to be able to know what our weaknesses are, our idols. And the thing about our idols is we love them, we trust them, and we obey them. Uh, When I arrived at All Souls, because I was on staff with John Stott, I longed to be seen as a fine Christian leader, which is a good thing. But because I was inefficient, what used to happen was, if people asked me if I'd done something, I'd say, yes, I had. I'd look them in the face, do a bare face lie, run off and do it before they'd found out, because I, I thought Christian leaders can't be inefficient. So that was a good thing, wanting to be a Christian leader, but it became a God thing for me. And you've got to know what your idols are. So let me give you some questions that help you diagnose idols. Because so often the devil attacks because we can't see them. The thing about idols is we're blind to them. And for all of us, they're different. So here are four questions that help identify idols. What can't I live without? What will I risk everything for? What gives my life meaning? What do I trust? What can't I live without? What will I risk everything for? What gives my life meaning? What do I trust? And your daydreams and nightmares, the Puritans said, will help you unlock those things. When you lose your temper, What you lose your temper over helps you unlock those things. It's very striking. Uh, My mum has died now, but um, she 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 was lovely. She was such a loving, caring mum. Came to Keswick and came came to faith towards the end of her life. She came used to come up uh, with my dad, with my brother and sister's kids. But you know, she declared war on my brother and his wife over the kids not going to the school she thought they should go to, because that was her idol. You know, and she's lovely, but in that area, she could not make peace with it. Even on her deathbed with, with um, my sister-in-law, she, there was no forgiveness. Almost rather not have grandchildren than the grandchildren not go to the school, she thought. Just an, an idol. It's not her call. I, idolatry. And uh, he gets into the tent. The kids have got to be moved. Uh, um, you know, uh, their beds must be moved. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and such joy as they think of what they've sorted out. And then, two days later, in the next door tent, the head of the household, the, a loving father, devoted husband, the breadwinner, they always camp by each other because they're godparents to each other's kids. You know, it's that sort of thing. He's killed fleeing the siege of AI, and he hadn't even said goodbye to his kids because he said to his wife, I'll be home for lunch. And they bring his body back. And then Achan and his family hear the chilling diagnosis uh, of, of chapter th- verse 13. There are devoted things among you, O Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. And we learn, verse 14, that one man will be picked from tribe, family, individual. And uh, God will give the identity. But he won't do it straight off. There's going to be a night So God is supernaturally going to put his hand on the person, but it'll be tomorrow morning. Why is that? Because God is giving him time to confess. We're going to see if he's going to come forward. But verse 15, whoever is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all the belongings that belongs to him. He's violated the covenant of the Lord and done a outrageous thing in Israel. Now, here's the question. At this moment in time, this is what leaders face. Here's the question. What will Achan do? Is he going to believe the chilling warning of Numbers 32, 23, which is, be sure that your sin will find you out? You know, does he believe that or not? That's the question. Does he believe it? Do you see? Be sure your sin will find you out. Now, just to say there's a promise there, isn't there, brothers and sisters? Be sure. Be sure your sin will find you out. Rico, be sure your sin will find you out. It's a promise. There's always a price to be paid for sin. He's banking, isn't he? As have the leaders who have failed us. They're banking on Psalm 139 verse 3 not being true. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Please jot this down. Christian maturity, says Jim Packer, is living all your life in the presence of God. 
So the immature Christian says, no, that now this, in this area here, I'm now out of God's presence. And I'll do what I like, and then I'll go back into that reality. But maturity is you live all your life in God's presence. So is he going to flirt with the belief, Achan, that no one knows? Well, now he's in what Bunyan called the valley of decision. And as he decides what to do, just remember what power, kindness, and blessing he's seen from the Lord. So he's just been through the desert, and he has seen that there's been manna and quail to feed them every day except for Sundays. He's seen water come out of a rock. He has watched as uh, the Jordan has dried up and they've walked across. And he's just walked round Jericho and watched the walls come down. So he has seen God's power and kindness and blessing. He's also seen what happens with disobedience because all those who rebelled were buried in the desert. Only two made it through, Joshua and Caleb. So very few are privileged to see that God provides as God has provided. I mean, God provides. That's been the lesson. Um, a mate of mine, Graham Daniels, I don't know him, he's the Christians in sport Welsh guy, he's an evangelist. He was speaking at a school in Milton Keynes and as he went to speak at the school he was waiting outside the headmaster's office and there was a boy next to him and the boy looked a little bit nervous and Graham looked across he's like me he's a nosy evangelist he said any problems and the boy went uh well yeah and Graham said penny for your thoughts and the boy said well yesterday while school was ending someone took a fire extinguisher off the wall and started running around and soaking people with it and Graham looked at him and said well, did you do it? And the boy replied, I don't know. <laughs> what didn't he know? Apparently, he'd soaked a third of the school and the vice head had seen him do it. What he didn't know was whether he was going to admit he'd done it. So the boy was standing there going, am I going to bluff the head or not? That's what he was thinking about. Am I going to bluff the head? Well, Achan is deciding whether to bluff God about his sin. Is he going to bluff him? That's the great question. So you can imagine how Achan got an early morning rush of adrenaline with the casting of lots. The guilty party uh, are going to be found out by Lot. So he's sitting there and his heart starts beating as the words, Judah, come out. And so all the other tribes drop back. It's just Judah. The Zerophites! And his light wife looks at him and holds her child to her breast. Zimri! And then his heart bursts. Achan! be sure your sin will find you out be sure your sin will find you out and please notice that Achan doesn't then voluntarily confess or repent they're going to be able to dig the treasure up in moments now this isn't a, a, a godly sorrow that leads to repentance this is discovery this isn't the prodigal son father I've sinned against heaven and against you I'm not worthy to be called your son verse 19 Joshua says tell me what you've done don't hide it from me it's true he said I've sinned against the Lord the tent is searched, and now it's judgment day. So Achan, his silver, gold, the robe, his sons and daughters are taken to the valley of Achor. And when Joshua says, why have you brought this trouble on us? Can we see that verse? Why have you brought this trouble on us? Don't you think that verse in verse 25, he pointed at 36 graves with widows and orphans standing there. So he said, why have you brought this trouble? This is where they buried them. The Lord will bring trouble on you. And don't you think that his son or daughter said just before they died, Daddy, what's your sin done to me? What's your sin done, Daddy? It's killed me. I'm going to die because of your sin, Daddy. The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then they, Israel stoned him, and after that, they'd stoned the rest, and they burned them. And of course, I know it's br brutal, it's absolutely brutal, but they can't enter the promised land with sin in the camp. So please come and be part of Passion for Life, the mission. Please stand with us uh, at next Easter, but we've got to deal with sin before we go. It's absolutely crucial. We've got to be confessing our sin. And uh, two, two questions as we close this. Why was um, Achan's sin so serious? 
And it is, of course, if we look back to chapter verse 1, the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. It wasn't Achan, it was the Israelites. So here, and this is so hard for us to get with our individualism, brothers and sisters, sin is corporate. So my sin affects you and your sin affects me. It's radioactive. And yet you see in the midst of our individualism, we just don't buy this. But look at verse 11. Do you see verse 11? They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen. They've lied. They've put them with their own possessions. That's why the Israelites uh, cannot stand. And in verses 24 to 26, God's anger falls on all of Achan's family. We're so individualistic. But can you see this impacts the whole congregation of Israel together? John Donne wrote, no man is an island entire of himself. Every man is a piece of the main, a piece of the continent, a part of the main. God is holy and he won't dwell in the midst of sin. So he withdraws from himself from the presence of his people if they continue to operate in sin. So one man had stolen property, one individual in the camp had betrayed God's trust and the verdict was not Achan has sinned but Israel has sinned. And that principle runs right through scripture and it is why church discipline is so important. (laughs) That's why church discipline is important because otherwise God departs. And uh, Jesus will bring God's judgment as he sees fit. Uh, And so so, uh, don't forget Revelation 6, men cry out for the rocks to fall on them rather than face the wrath of the land. But nevertheless, we are warned that if our home congregations harbour and tolerate, secretly condone what Jesus hates, then he will act to discipline us and withdraw from us such that even the tiniest objective will be impossible. And uh, again, if you heard me last night talk about where um, uh, uh, denominations are corporately saying we'll turn away from God's view of marriage, so the Methodists, as I said last night, have said not Uh, that marriage is between a man and a woman, but marriage is between two people. By the way, that overturns the whole view of what a marriage pictures, doesn't it? So the husband's love for his wife is a picture of Christ's love for the church. And so it overturns from Genesis 2 onwards, the foundation of human society, but also this picture of the gospel. It's absolute disobedience to the authority of Scripture. And if we do that, then what happens is God just leaves. And again, the agony of this, I'm an evangelist, is that liberal churches die. They just die because the spirit departs. I will come and remove my lampstand. Let's have a look. Do you see uh, uh, in our papers here, just uh, uh, on the inside page there, Ephesus, Pergamum, and Thyatira. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Revelation 2, if you don't repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. That's the sign of God's presence and power. I'll leave. Pergamum, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols, by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you have those who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I'll come to you, will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, what's interesting in Pergamum is it's not that they are doing the sexual immorality, but people in the congregation are, and they're not disciplining them. So tolerance is the great problem there. Tolerance. Thyatira, I have this against you here again. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality but she's unwilling. So I'll cast her on a bed of suffering and I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of of her ways. But again, it's not that you do it, you tolerate it. Just huge for the Anglican church, those things. We can have questions at the end. But my sin affects you and yours affects me. And the principle here is, I won't be with you anymore. So the question now is, please jot this down. Here's the question. What are you hiding from God in your home? What are you hiding from God in your home? What is hidden? Because let me tell you, it's safely under lock and key. What besetting sin some lie, some relationship, I don't know what it is, some tax evasion, I don't know, or some secret sin. But let me say to you from this, it is never your business alone. It spills over into the lives of others. 
Um, and, 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 and this sin has a contagious power. Um, I came to faith through the boarding school movement, through the Titus Trust, the Ewan Trust. I was from a non-Christian home. I was converted at boarding school when I was 15 through a mass teacher, Christopher Ash. That organisation is on its knees because of the sin of Jonathan Fletcher and John Smythe. So I just, and I think the door is shutting to so many boys and girls hearing the, hearing the gospel in those schools. But their sin has been so profoundly contagious, the cancer of it, and dealt with very badly with the culture, I know that. But actually, if you look at what they've done, just the damage they've done, just agony, really. Be sure your sin will find you out. And of course, the sin here was covetousness. Verse 11, he saw, he stole, he lied. Interestingly, Francis Xavier said, in 40 years of listening to confession, no one has confessed the sin of covetousness. What's covetousness? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Um, Some people, 1 Timothy 6, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves. Just a little bit more. That idol. And then, as we close, how do you get out of a situation in which you think uh, uh, you might be holding up the work of God? What do you do? Well, don't bluff God. Confess your sin and kill the spider. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth isn't in us. If we confess our sins, he'll be faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So amazingly, I hear those words from the gospel. You see, you see, Achan was taken out and stoned. He was taken out of the camp and stoned for his sin. Jesus is taken out of the camp and stoned for mine. Jesus dies outside the camp for my sin. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. But what I must do is ruthlessly kill the spider. Either you kill it or it'll come back and kill you. So that's what's happened if you look at Ravi and Jonathan Fletcher. They didn't deal with sin and it came back and killed them. Kill the spider. Fear its danger. Flee. Flee as you would from a wild animal in the pastorals, Paul tells Timothy. Flee. Run. So what is causing you to sin? And Jesus says, Mark 9, 43, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, it's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands go, go, go into hell where the fire never goes out. Be ruthless, be absolutely ruthless. And of course, accountability. Achan's wife should have said, shouldn't she? Achan's wife, she should have said, you idiot, go back now and, and, and put that treasure straight into where the rest of the plunder is. If only his wife had said, you stupid fool. How, you know, this is madness. Join the CIA, confidentiality, intimacy, accountability. I've got a friend and we meet up once a month and we ask each other this question. What question do you not want me to ask you? That's what we ask each other. I lied to him, but not as much as I used to. (laughs) But, um, you know, know, we've got to face these things. And, uh, and, and we mustn't bluff God. Be sure your sin will find you out. Let's just pray. Oh, Father God, be sure your sin will find you out. Lord, we think of ourselves and our home churches. We think of the mess that there's been over the last two years. Lord, please help us to heed this warning. For some here, there'll be the moment in the valley of decision. Be sure your sin will find you out. Please, Lord. Please, for the sake of Jesus and our congregations and our families and our children, loved ones and dependents, please, Lord, help us go to the cross, know that we can be forgiven and keep battling sin. Amen. And just to say with sin, there are two things here, aren't there? Number one, either you lie down and say, I can't do anything about this, this is just what I'm like, which is where Ravi and Jonathan Fletcher ended up, or... You say, no, no, it's like a boxer. I get knocked over. I'm getting up off the mat and I'm fighting again. I'm battling again. We're going to have questions in a moment, but I just want to show you just this little outline here, just as we come to it. Do you see um, the self-leadership? So how do, we, how do we then try and lead ourselves in the midst of this? What do we then do? Well, here's a little diagram uh, that, that I've developed and um, uh, um, I, I was very helped um, with um, CBT, Cognitive Behaviour Therapy, because it, it leads with thinking, which is biblical. Um, we've got Joshua's 
uh, seven Achan sin in the middle there. And let's just, let's just as we come to this um, diagram, let me just walk you through it a little bit. So this is what happens as I'm trying to self-lead. I start, can you see up there, and you can see it, you see it on your uh, diagrams. I start with my thinking in the morning. And then I go down to my feelings. So they're important. And with my thinking, do jot this down, I want to feel my feelings change. I want to do a Romans 12, 1 and 2. In view of God's mercy, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. I want to so be amazed by God's mercy that I want to make choices, here's bottom left here, that go God's way. And then I've got to watch my physical health because how I'm feeling um, is hugely important. It's interesting with Ravi Zacharias, he had a very bad back, but actually as he mismanaged that back, he kept on having masseur after masseur after masseur. They got younger and more attractive. And he used that bad back, as, but he said always, well, I've got to have my back massaged. But other things happened. So how do I handle physical health? Am I getting sleep? Uh, uh, what about exercise at the moment? After lockdown, I'm 20 pounds overweight. I've got to sort of sort that out, that physical health thing. And the, the next thing is environment. What is hitting your environment? And of course, what hit, what hit and the devil will do this, of course, what hit Achan's environment was the treasure. Suddenly he was being offered all this money. That's what hit it, the opportunity. And what do we do with that? So let's just do thinking, feeling, choices, physical health. Think of Eve in the Garden of Eden. The devil puts into her head, into her thinking, you can't trust God. He's not good. He doesn't want you to be like him. Now listen to this. She then feels resentment. And that is absolutely key for people who mismanage themselves. They're in resentment. They're angry at God. You're either in resentment or, brothers and sisters, this is key, each day you're in thanksgiving. And how do I make sure, because thankful people are happy people and they serve, and resentful people, the devil sows rebellion in them. So as a Christian leader, I'm always, my antennae are out at church, always for resentment. I remember I, uh, uh, Jonathan Fletcher's older brother, David, who's been caught in the middle of all this. Uh, I walked into St. Ebbs um, uh, many years ago when I was at Theological College 30 years ago, and I wasn't looking very happy one morning at his church in Oxford. And he saw me and he said, oh, Rico, are you still going to heaven? I said, well, yes. He said, oh, that's all right. I thought something was wrong. And he walked off. <laughs> but he, you know, and I thought, well, yeah, I am going to heaven. Well, be thankful. So how do I make sure... How do I, that I make sure that in my thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful, I, I, I'm leading to thanksgiving and then choices to serve? Well, can you see, as we look down here, these are some questions I ask myself each day. So I went through them this morning, but I have this thinking and thanksgiving, these questions, and can you see them there? When was I converted? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You do know, don't you, that you were chosen before the hills round Keswick were made. You do know that, don't you? You were chosen before the hills were made. When you look at those hills, you've been in God's mind longer than them. And that's why you're here today. Brothers and sisters, that's overwhelming, but it's the truth of Ephesians 1. Before the beginning of time, Isaiah, God carved my name in his hands. He then sent his son to die, which is no small thing. He sent his spirit when I was full against him and absolutely self-centered. He turned my heart around. He's given me worthwhile things to do. And brothers and sisters like you who are commanded to love me, and then one day I'll stand before him and he'll say, Rico Tice, it's good to see you. You've been on my mind a very long time. <laughs> That's the story we're in. Thanksgiving. And then as we look down, how was I converted? For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. We looked at this the other day. But God did a miracle in line with the power that made the world and opened my eyes to him. That's why I'm converted through a miracle. What kind of today is today? Romans 8 verse 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. And what is that purpose? To grow more like Jesus, to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. 
So here, jot this down, brothers and sisters. I find this such a help, this phrase. Today's a great day because today's the day God has planned for me. And if it's good for God, it's good for me. Every day's a great day because God is working all things together for good to make me more like Christ. And that might mean that as I walk back to uh, where I'm staying to take my boys out uh, 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 at lunchtime, I get hit by a car and lose both my legs. Well, I'll get new legs in the new creation. And on the way, I've just got to be godly. So the only two things in life are I'm going to heaven and on the way I've got to be godly. And God is organising that. And as I say that, brothers and sisters, some of you will be in the midst of, you'll just be going, Rico, how do I work this out? Please don't ask me out the door. I'm an evangelist. I have no idea. Don't ask me about some bit of suffering you've got. Ask a pastor teacher. It's not for me to do. But what I am saying to you is this, is that one day it'll be over. Let's keep going and keep being godly. But I don't know why something has happened. Please, I don't know. I look at the Psalms of Lament. I look at Psalm 88. Oh, but we're on the way to heaven, on the way we've got to be godly. And we've got to trust him if we can. And we trust him by not allowing what we don't understand to destroy what we do understand. We understand Good Friday and Easter Day, and we hold on to that. How does God feel about me? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. How does God feel about me? He's delighted with me because he's delighted with Jesus. Isn't it amazing? Today, and I'm so full of sin, but God's delighted with me. I just can't believe it. Um, and, 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 and then why is today a better day than yesterday? Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. So, so what does that mean? Today's a better day than yesterday because I'm a day's march closer to heaven. And for the non-Christian, it's a worse day because they're a day's march closer to hell. Now, every day I go through this stuff and I find, you know, I go through these questions this little sort of, you know, catechesis, and then I, 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 I find I feel my feelings change, and I want to serve. So I'm then trying to be in, in, not in resentment, but thanksgiving, but in terms of choices, again, what I'm then trying to do is work at two areas that will, again, time and again, take me down. So anger and lust will be two areas for, for most Christian leaders. In terms of anger, um, I go through verses and I mortify the flesh. So I pray in these verses, did this this morning, and I ask the Spirit to bring them to bear so that I will be self-controlled in that area today. So these are the anger verses. Ephesians 4, 26, 27. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're angry. Don't give the devil a foothold. Lord, please, may my anger not give the devil a foothold. Lord, please. Job was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned the evil. Lord, may I be like him today. Like a city without walls is a man who lacks self-control. Proverbs 25, 28. Father, please give me the self-control today. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Matthew 5, verse 7. Lord, please, mercy. And so I then have an AAR call on my anger each day. A A R. Acknowledge the anger, just going, gosh, I'm feeling cross about that. Second R, absorb it. Third one, respond to it. So it might be going back to the person, it might be just saying, give them a break. It might be saying, Lord, I, that has, but I'm just going to try and be gracious here. But I'm acknowledging it, I'm not letting it just, just rumble away inside with this passive aggression. Okay, so that's anger. And secondly, so obviously, uh, with, with so many leaders that fall, lust. I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to uh, lose one part of your body, the whole part of your body be thrown into hell. Joseph to Potiphar's wife, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? The pastorals, treat the young women as sisters with absolute purity. And so you pray in those verses. And, uh, and, uh, and again here, um, uh, are looking to make sure you're making choices. Now, here's the issue. If you're tired, physical health, those two areas are going to be more difficult, but you've actually got them on the map. So let's just uh, uh, flick back here to our map. You see, I'm going, gosh, I've just got to watch it here. Now, the other thing on physical health is my doctrine of creation. 
which is why coming to Keswick is so great. The hills are so great. Because actually that does help me, that doctrine of creation, to be someone who gets their soul fed in the right place. Um, so it's very interesting. Sunday and a day off, we don't break God's laws, they break us. I remember a Christian evangelist saying to me once, he said to me, Rico, I didn't take a day off because I was working so hard for the Lord. And then all the days I missed, I took in a row. So we don't break God's laws, they break us. Are you taking your day off? Um, my, on my day off, do you know what I do? I give my wife my phone. That's how I show it's my day off. That's the boundary. So she knows I'm with the family today. So I take my phone, I give it to my wife. That's, that's the day off. It might be that I'll do an hour in the morning just to clear stuff. But the sovereignty of God lets me take a day off. You see, it's God's work, not mine, so I can rest because it's his work. But so many, so many people get into trouble because they're not resting. If you look at the schedule that Ravi had sometimes, madness. Where does that take you? You know, what do you do that's fun? I play golf. You know, uh, I, I, like, I like walking to school to, with my daughter and back. I always watch the rugby highlights. You know, so what, spiritual, emotional, physical dials, what are, you, what are you doing there? So can you see, I'm just trying to map myself here and map my wife. I've got to love her and understand her as I do my own body, Ephesians 5, and actually even members of the church family and fellow members of staff. What's their map? How are they going on their thinking, their feelings, their choices, their physical health? What's hit them in the environment? Now, with COVID, I mean, I've, there's so many funerals. Sometimes what you have to do is something really tough hits, and you put it in a box here and say, I've got to get that out later. That's such a... I can't think about that now because I've got to do this, but I'm going to go come back to that this evening. Before Lucy and I came down here, we had a tragedy in terms of some friends we know, and we've just been reeling this week. But you've got to prepare stuff, but also say, okay, let's unpack that together. But it just gives me a map that I'm working with here. One thing, just as we close... Um, going back down to feelings down here, uh, um, we, we, we've got to understand it's a cursed world. So in our subconscious, they're going to be core thinking that we've got that keeps coming against the gospel. So my parents lived abroad. I got sent to a boarding school when I was eight. I'm just about recovered now. I'm just about through the experience. But I go off to this boarding school, by the way, the same one as John Cleese went to. So we're a happy lot. And um, it's now an old people's home, so I'm going to move back in when I've, when I've got dementia. <laughs> and I'll wake up dreaming I'm back at that school and find I am. So it's going to be marvellous. But, um, but I was taught as an eight-year-old going to that school three things. You're not good enough. Prove yourself, and it's a dangerous world. And I knew it was dangerous because the prefect in my dorm got into bed with the prefect in the next door dorm each night. So it was dangerous. You're not good enough, Tice. Prove yourself is a dangerous world. And there's no mum there. You don't, you don't process stuff. So you live by achievement. And so all the love is conditional. We'll love you if you achieve. And if you don't achieve, we won't love you. So, so that's, that's, what they, that's what they put in. Now, can you imagine the wonder of the gospel? So when I heard the gospel when I was 15, you're not good enough. I know I'm not. That's why Jesus died. Prove yourself. No, I live by his righteousness, not my own. It's a dangerous world. Yes, but... He's sovereign. I mean, gosh, the gospel. But what I'm saying is, I know the core stuff that's going on there. I know, I know what my core thinking is. Do you know yours? So if we keep hitting repetitive drivenness, which is what I had, you've got to try and get it unpacked. So, so again, having someone, I, you know, I went and saw a psychiatrist after a broken engagement on that. But also, you've got to know, the, you've got to know, the, um, you've got to know the stuff that, that's wounded you. And your, your loved ones have to. So on that map here, so down here again on feelings, um, this is a magazine after I got converted at boarding school. Um, people took exception to it. And uh, let, um, every month when I was 17, 18, after I'd become a Christian, a magazine would come out, go around the boarding houses. So I'd walk into the central feeding at the school, 600 boys, and I knew they'd all read it. Let me read you. It's called Lordy Lordy. Let me read you a bit of it. Um, Christianity, you'll find, Rico, is just a phase you're going through. Don't let other people get caught up in your whirlpool of religious fantasy. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. No, just F off. And uh, let me read you the end of it. So this is just one of the copies. 
Uh, dear Lord, we at Lordy Lordy plea for forgiveness in order that our sins may be remitted. We decree that the God Squad should be allowed to continue to amuse us with their unseemly actions and to shock us with their impractical and out-of-date a- attitudes. Let us also repent of exposing the God Squad's religious antics, antics. And God, help us to see that in mocking the Christians, we're mocking you, O Holy One. We're still adamant in agreeing that Rico is a senseless jerk. Amen. So three pages of this stuff, and it would come out each month. Uh, nothing done to protect me by the authorities. Now, what I'm saying is that put into my head an inability to cope with conflict, and, it, and I have bombs that go off in conflict, but I'm aware of it, brothers and sisters. I know when they've gone off. You've got to know your blind spots. Now, please jot this down. We must know our blind spots, and we've got to help other people with theirs. And if anything's come up with Fletcher and Ravi, it's the blind spot issue. And so, so again, just again, when stuff comes along, you think, I didn't get that wrong. What are my blind spots? Two books that really helped me on this. One on anger, mind over mood by Podesky. Really helped. I have them down here so you can take a copy. Reinventing Your Life. This one written by a non-Christian, but actually incredibly helpful by Jeffrey Young. Again, going through and you just do surveys on yourself. And I realized how... Um, being sent away when I was eight had had just such an impact and why I have to keep applying adoption to myself. I'm at home. Uh, The Lord has adopted me. But again, it's just, brothers, sisters, can you see here, I've just got a map on myself, on self-leadership that I'm using every day. We've got a couple of minutes for questions. Should we just throw them out? Thanks a lot, Ben, if anyone's got any questions. Anyone got a question? Just throw it out. By the way, silence means agreement. I always think that. But uh, <laughs> any questions? Yeah, one in the middle there. Uh, about idols. Yeah. From Joshua. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, obviously there, there are lots, but these are the ones. I mean, by the way, this is so much of this idolatry stuff is one so thankful to Tim Keller, who's helped us with it. But. Um, Yeah. yeah, what gives my life meaning? What do I trust? What will I risk everything for? What can't I live without? Great questions for Keswick to just go around and thinking, where am I on that? Uh, the first one was acknowledge the anger. Don't just wander, just go, gosh, I'm feeling angry. The second one was absorb it. So spend 24 hours going, gosh, I'm angry there. Now just withdraw. You can't be losing your temper. If I lose my temper with, me, with you, James 3, you, got, you can't hear me teach the Bible. So I've got, to, I've, got to, you know, I've got to think, gosh, I'm cross here. Rico, just step back from this situation because you've got to absorb it and then respond. But don't step back and just crash it down. Step back and go, okay, I might make a call later. I might leave it, but at least I'm going to deal with it internally. So I go acknowledge, absorb, respond. I have got a temper. I can't afford to lose it. And actually in lockdown, I lost it twice. And, uh, you know, it was really bad. And um, it just, just what's COVID done to us all. Yeah. Yes. Um, should, should confession primarily be between us and God or us and other people? Oh, brother, great question. Look, of course, we begin with the Lord. But if we're, we've got to be in a safe place where we say, brother, can you help me repent? So I'm going to try and put these things in that will stop me doing that again, and I need your help with that. So, of course, it is between me and the Lord, but it is good to find a trusted same-sex person that you can say, you know, please, um, let, you know, I'm trying to do this. This is the action I'm taking. Yeah. Great, everybody. Let me pray as we close. Oh, Father God, we have such a battle with sin. Lord, thank you that we are cleansed, that we have the gift of righteousness. So at this moment in time, we thank you for this forgiveness that Jesus gives us and his performance of perfection that he gives us to. But a moment now to think about the battle we're in or maybe the need to speak to someone. Oh, Father, please help us. Please help us to fight again. Lord, where your Holy Spirit is convicting us in one area, help us to see that and to have the humility to fight. Amen. 
Uh, just to say, everyone, um, Faithful Leaders is the little book. It's short, 100 pages, but it's the book that came out of all this. So um, it's on the bookstall. Do go and grab a copy. Yeah. Take his servants up to their return. 